Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. No tool fits all. Why building a solid toolbox matters. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Heather Mahalik, SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Heather. Thank you, Carol. Can everyone hear me okay? And Carol, I have a screen that popped up this start broadcast. Do you want me to ignore that? Yes, go ahead and ignore that. All right, sorry. Okay, so this webcast is me redoing, um, with a few slides added at the end, my keynote that I did at the Magnet User Summit in Vegas in May. Um, I was asked by Jad to present on essentially why Axiom couldn't be the only tool in the toolbox, which I found interesting that a vendor would ask me to do such a thing because most people want you to pitch their tools. So I put together um, this presentation on essentially why you should not use just one tool and why you need a solid toolbox. And obviously everyone's toolbox is going to be different and I will give you some examples of mine because that is probably one of the most popular questions I get immediately is what do you actually use? Um, a little bit about me and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but I am the Director of Forensic Engineering at Mantec Card. That's my full time job during the day. I have been with SANS for almost 10 years now. Um, I'm a senior instructor, course author. I teach both 585, which is the Advanced Smartphone class, and 500, the Windows Forensics course. Um, I've been doing everything in InfoSec for around 15 years. I worked a lot of child exploitation at the beginning of my career, visa fraud, passport fraud, and since then have really dove into mobile devices. Um, my blog is listed here, and I'll refer to this frequently, but you'll see I blog at smarterforensics.com. And the rest about me, I am human. I am a mom, a wife. I love bourbon. I can be bribed with bourbon. So if anyone's ever looking to bribe me, that's the best way to get my attention. And I'll try to entertain you with some fun memes and just little screenshots in here as well. And I know that the subject of this slide is somewhat alarming to some, but it is true when it comes to your forensic toolbox. If you are monogamous with one tool, at some point you are going to either not realize that your tool is forgetting or not able to parse something, or you may be completely unaware because you have such a monogamous relationship, just one-on-one -on -one with that specific tool. So you are going to need more than one tool, and I'm going to try to highlight why in this presentation. Uh, for those of you who have seen me present in the past, you know I always, always sit there and harp on people about you cannot use just one tool, it's impossible. Um, there are free solutions. So you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on all of the latest and greatest on the market. What you need to decide is which tool is best for you based upon the devices you see. Um, do you only see mobile devices? Do you also see hard drives? Are you going to be dealing with memory images? So all of these things really factor in. Um, the hardest thing for people, though, is to realize that they're going to have to test. You're going to have to break out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to try things that you may not have done, such as create your own data sets. Um, in order to know what your tool is doing, that is honestly the best way. So to cut right to the chase, um, this is me, myself, as Heather Mahalik, not SANS, not what SANS tells us to use or what we use in 585. This is what I use every day when I work my investigations. Um, and then I have my special occasion ones on the right, which I'll mention as well. But for everyday tools, if I'm working a cell phone image, I will usually acquire it. And I'll just be honest here, my first option is youth had 4 pc I'm comfortable with it. Um, I know when it fails, why it's usually failing, so what the issues are there. Um, I also like Oxygen Forensic Detective and Magnet as acquisition tools. Um, what's really nice about Magnet here is that it is free because you can get Magnet Acquire and just use that. If it's cloud data, Elcomsoft, which I'll talk about later, is one of my favorites and I'll mention why. But I always revert back to iTunes and just ADB 
and go back to the basics for creating iPhone backups and Android backups. That may honestly be your best method. Um, the database browser for SQLite, you'll see a ton in this presentation. It is still one of my favorites. Um, I do use the SQLite forensic browser by Paul Sanderson, but I know that's also not free. So I try to include some options here for you. Um, if I'm working a Windows hard drive, my go-to tools would honestly be Xways, Blacklight, and Axiom, just because they're fantastic with the Windows images. And yes, if you take 500 with me from the SANS course, you will see that I do introduce Blacklight into that classroom. It is fantastic what it can do on a Windows hard drive. And if you're curious about more on this, I did write a blog recently on what's in my toolbox and how I think it helps me in my investigation. So the strong suits of each of these tools. And I have a link for that at the end. So feel free to go out and read that if you're looking for more advice on that. Because a lot of people email me and say, hey, I see Androids, which tools should I have? And that's where you really have to decide by trying all of these options. And then you also have to consider this. Do your tools make your investigation easier or are they actually making your life harder? Um, one of the biggest things I see every single day is when the tools contradict one another. And that's the first example I'm going to give you in the slides coming up. Um, also, what happens when an update comes out? When iOS releases iOS 12 this fall, who is going to be the first to actually parse it? Are they going to successfully parse it? Um, what does successful parsing mean? Can they even acquire it? So all of these things you have to factor in. What happens when Android comes out with another mechanism for encryption? Is there a way to get around it? Um, if that happens, do you have the phones required to do this testing? And that is probably the greater hardship, I would say, when we do smartphone forensics, because these phones are expensive. It's not like we're dealing with simple smartphones anymore. It's not like you can have just a USB and test disk-based forensics to see what's going on iPhones and Androids are very, very expensive. You could spend easily 500 to 1,000 US dollars on each one. So we wanna make sure that as a community, we're communicating and people are taking on these things to do some testing themselves. Um, once you have phones, don't ever get rid of them. Keep them because you wanna make sure even though the latest OSs and devices are supported that you don't lose support for the old stuff because you will be able to see that in your investigations. And you wanna make sure that you're not just staying as current as the latest and greatest because you don't want the old stuff to haunt you. Um, once you look at your tools, when your tool parses something, does it tell you where it's pulling it from? That's huge because we need to be able to say, tool X said that it found this, where did it find it? And that is what I think the best feature of Axiom is. IEF, we couldn't dive right into the file system itself, but with Axiom, we can. We have essentially IEF as a wrapper when we look at the artifacts tab and then we actually can dive in and see where is it pulling it from. Um, Celebrate also does a fantastic job. Oxygen does a fantastic job at telling you where it's pulling the information from. What I think is shady and what always piques my interest is when the tool parses something and does not link its source. So hopefully that will also pique your interest in your investigations and you'll dive a little deeper to actually uncover the truth on that. Um, one thing that is dangerous here is a lot of people rely so much on their tool, almost as a crutch, that they know just enough to speak smartly about it, but enough so that it could be dangerous and jeopardize their career. So be very, very careful with what you're doing, that you're not assuming that your tool is always crap because you don't want to get in a situation where it's not. All right, so now I'm going to break down some examples for you. And I am going to do questions at the end, but I do have the question window open. So if a question pops up and if it catches my eye and it makes sense, I will answer it on the fly. So feel free to type them in as you have any. So scenario one, we are going to be looking at FaceTime. And in this example, it's the two parties have different stories. So we need to prove, was it a FaceTime video call or was it a FaceTime audio call? And where this could really make sense Let's say that I receive a call and you, the listener right now, you claim that I gave you my password and told you to access my cloud data. And then I go to the police and I say that you hacked my account. You say, this is not true. I had a FaceTime video call with Heather. I can confirm it was her. 
I saw her face, we communicated, and that's that. I tell the police that is not true. It must have been a FaceTime audio. My coworker, who is against me, was speaking on my behalf, gave my password and permission to access my cloud data. Do you think we can tell the truth? What are your thoughts here? You think you can actually, do you think these tools tell you if it's FaceTime audio or video? Most people would say, who even cares? It was FaceTime. But you should care because what if it's a situation like this? So that's what we're going to look at in this first example here. We're going to look at what actually occurs. So we have two examples here. We have FaceTime with Axiom Examine, and then we have Oxygen Detected below. And I'm gonna use my little highlighter here. So our question or our item right here that we're looking at is this number that starts with plus one six, we can see it was an outgoing. Um, over here, Axiom says it was FaceTime audio, that it was answered, the date March 13th, 2018 at 11.35 for 344 seconds. And the location of that phone number is Norristown, Pennsylvania, United States. What does this FR right here give you an indication of? Don't be shy, type in the chat. Anybody know what that potentially means? So the Norristown, Pennsylvania is the partner of the call or the person that I was contacting, the remote party. What do you think FR represents? I will give another moment and then I will continue. This is how I like to challenge my simulcast students too, or anyone that takes my class V live. I wait for you to answer. All right, no one's typing in the chat or maybe you're just typing slowly and I can't see it. I'll assume that, that you all typed it in. So FR, I was actually, in, yes, thank you. You are, you are correct. Everyone that's typing it in, it is France. I was in Paris, France when I made that call. And Daniel, I love your answer there. I really like this, that you're all answering now. So I was in Paris, France when I conducted this FaceTime call. Um, so a good indicator of where the user was. And I like the guest afforded too. That was really good. In front camera, these are all really good. I like them. So here we have Axiom telling us, hey, it was FaceTime audio, which means I am telling the truth in this situation. But you are smart and you throw it in a different tool. So we now look at it down here in Oxygen Detective and here it's saying, okay, it's FaceTime video. We see the little video camera or just FaceTime generic. And then we see all the same information. And again, we have FR. So now you have to decide at this point, which one is correct. So this is where you could do a few things. You could cry, you could pretend this didn't happen, um, or you can dig. What I recommend is the latter. I want you to dig. This is also where it's very helpful for your tool to tell you where is it getting this information from. Because if it's not, you have to know that the FaceTime video is going to be in the call history, that store data. So here in Axiom, I just look over on the right hand side, which would be kind of on the right hand of your screen over here. And it would tell me that it was in the call history.store data, and I go there. So now I'm in Axiom, for those of you who have never seen it, and I'm in the call history DB, and I see this call history.store data. Now, one thing that I personally do is I now open this with an external viewer. I will open this with the database browser for SQLite, and I like that Axiom gives me the options to do that type of thing, that it doesn't make you just stay in the tool. And I drafted a query here. So in the query, I'm like, just show me things I care about. My primary key, the call type, the service provider. Um, I wrote a simple case statement to show if it was incoming or outgoing. Um, my date time, I'm decoding that. And then also the duration, country code, and all this other good stuff. And then I kind of cheat a little bit down here and I said, hey, show me where Z service, Z provider is like FaceTime, just to make it a little bit easier so I don't see all of my calls, which there's a lot of calls in this call history database file. And down here we can see that I have a FaceTime call, that it was outgoing, the date, my duration in seconds, France, Norristown, Pennsylvania, everything lines up, everything looks good. And then I see this right here. I told it to only show me FaceTime, but I see these two different status types, the 16 and the eight. Now this is where you have to do testing. If you are not willing to test, you have to choose which tool you trust the most at this point. Um, the fact that there are status flags right there, 
to me mean one of those means FaceTime video and one of those means FaceTime audio. Um, when I wrote the first edition of Practical Mobile Forensics, I made the big mistake of listing the status flags in the book because I trusted that Apple would keep this consistent. And then I found with different iOS releases that these status flags change for call type. So do not trust what you test one time on the next iOS version. Make sure you are actually verifying each time. Um, the easiest way to do this is simply do a FaceTime call. One is audio, one is video. Do an iTunes backup of your phone. If you're looking at an iPhone, which I am here, and look at the difference. It's very, very quick. What I will usually do is I will call my husband and then I text him immediately after saying that was a FaceTime audio or that was a FaceTime video. And then I document it so that when I go back to find it, it's easy. So then I change my case statement just a little bit. So all I wanna do now is say, okay, now when the call type is 16, I want that to show that it's FaceTime audio. And when it's eight, it's FaceTime video. And that simple query then goes and shows exactly how Axiom is parsing it. So it was a FaceTime audio call. So the person who said that they had permission to log in because they saw me was lying. And we could see that it was FaceTime outgoing and all the same information, which is exactly what Axiom was doing. So in this example here, Axiom was correct. And it's not that Oxygen was not correct. It just wasn't parsing that status flag, which is something that you could easily do if you have some basic SQL knowledge, if you can write a simple query, or if you can grab something like this that's already been done for you and the status flags match, you could easily do that yourself. You could technically do this without a query if you open the database with your own test data and you know which was which. So that's example one. Now we're gonna go into example two here. And I tried to keep this across the board, like lots of different options, everything from simple call logs to application analysis, and then we're gonna branch out a little bit. So here we're looking at a situation where only the app knows the truth. So a simple task, um, a crime has been committed, and we need to prove that a call was made on a specific Android device. You would think this is pretty easy. Um, I love when people are like, how easy is it to find the phone number on a device? Sometimes that's the hardest thing we have to do. But most of us assume that finding a call log would be the easiest. So I had my device and here's what I see as I start looking through this. So I load this and the call logs, I can see that I do have three call logs on an Android, which I do think is strange. Even if you are looking at a teenager's phone, you should find call logs. So here I have call logs from July, 2017, but none of those are for my call, which was of interest. The call of interest is January 17, 2018. Um, the phone number of interest is that one that's highlighted there. The 9440355 are the final characters that we care about or digits. So where would you go now? We can look and this is not what we need. Are there any indicators on this slide of where else the phone number or the phone call may exist? So your clue would be to look over here. And at this point, some people say, well, you know what? I am going to keyword search. And you can. You can definitely keyword search. And Jeremy, that's excellent. He's saying chat section. So you're saying go right in here at chats and look at a 127. And that's the next thing I did. I looked at chats and they are not there. So what would you do next? Look at that screen. Jeremy, you're on the right track. So we looked in mobile, it's not there. We go up the chat, we don't see it. <coughs> Excuse me. Any other thoughts? Or is there, yes, Preston, thank you. Let me move the screen over because I wanna see who I'm actually talking to here. So Preston said custom, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're gonna go down here into custom. Anything you see over here, that means there's a hit for that number. So in custom, it's saying five. We're gonna jump over into custom and take a look at this. So in custom here, what we start to see is, we look down the list here and it's telling us, okay, my weather, we see some weather apps, some profile, smart dial, five. Ironically, if we go back to slide, the custom was also five. It had five keyword hits. 
So that's an easy way for you to narrow down which one it is. So here we can see silent circle, silent phone, smart dial table. Anything that's smart dial, assume that could be associated with the call. So when we look over here under databases, we have this dialer DB. And then what I did was just open it again. And here I opened it just in Axiom. And this is why I usually branch out and use a different tool. So you can get a quick glimpse if you need to, if you look down here and we see our information, but I like to write the query and just have more control of it. So can we get the information from looking right here? Yes, we can, but I wanna dig a little bit deeper. So I wrote a query and here's the example of this. And also all of these slides will be available to you through the webcast. Um, if you have interest in any of the queries and you don't wanna copy and paste them, if you shoot me an email, I will be nice enough to email those to you if they'll help you with your investigation. But what you can do here is I'm saying specific things I want. And then where I made it unique down here was just saying, hey, where the phone number is like 9440355. And then look, there it is. It's the ninth one. And then we can see the phone number, the contact ID for Kathy Bell. The last time it was dialed, which was 117 2018. And then we see our information. And this is exactly what the claim was. Now, I have a few comments in here that I do want to point out. So under date time, and I learned this from testing it, the last smart dial time does not mean the app was used. It does not mean that silent phone was used to create this. On this actual device, I found this very weird. I installed silent phone. I could not get it to work. But once I installed it, it asked for permission to my call logs, my contacts, and I gave it permission. So even though I was making calls as a normal Android user, it was all being captured and stored in this dialer DB by this app. Um, I never successfully logged in and used silent phone. So even though you see last smart dial used here, that could be a normal call log. And then down here, last use, same thing. It was a normal call log. And then times used, also it was a normal call log. And at least down here, it says times used zero and last use NA. But right here, last smart dial time, that could be misleading because this could lead you to say, you know what? I think the user used silent phone and they're trying to mask their call logs, which is what I was intentionally trying to do, but it never successfully installed. So just be very, very careful with some of these apps and how you're interpreting it. And this is where creating my own data was key because the app actually didn't do it. Another thing that I wanna point out here is when you do something like this and you create, create these queries or scripts that parse apps that you find in the custom section over here of Axiom or IEF, whatever you're using, if you post it down here at magnetforensics.force, the artifact exchange, other people can grab it. And then that's an easier way to share. And I promise all of you, anything that I do that's unique here, I will always post it to the Artifact Exchange because that's an easy way for you to grab it and for us to share as a community. And if you work in a location where you're not allowed to do that and you want someone to post on your behalf, um, I know I would be happy to do it. Jessica Hyde from Magnet, I'm sure she would be happy to do it. So if you just reach out to someone and say, hey, keep me anonymous, here's a new query that would work for you, many people would be happy to post that for you. All right, scenario three, Alexa. And ironically, I spoke to um, someone that's doing reporting yesterday about Internet of Things. And Alexa was one of their key topics. And everyone, this is one of the hottest new things is your Apple Watch, your Alexa, all these things that are listening and tracking us at all times. And how can it help our investigation? So when I was updating the 585 challenge with my co-author, Cindy Murphy and Lee Krugnelli, one of the things I thought that would be cool, we have a potential, well, it's a homicide, that definitely does occur, but what we have is, I was thinking that no one would actually hear it except for Alexa. And I was going through this random scenario of all these things may actually occur, and then there are real cases like that. So it's ironic that what I was recommending is actually occurring all of the news. So when we look at my situation here, a crime has been committed, and Alexa may be the only one that heard. Can you or can't you decode Alexa and what goes on? And I have a question coming in really quick. Oh, Chris, thank you. Chris is saying he's also happy to post anything that anybody can't do for 
job reasons or job security. So let's take a look at what Alexa is going to do. So first claim here, um, and this is from my testing, most tools don't do, and I have in quotes, do Internet of Things. Even if they advertise it, they are not doing it well. Um, I know, I believe, physical analyze. Oh my gosh, I'm not even, Alexa off. My Alexa just picked up, and now she's also listening to me giving you this talk. I didn't even think about unplugging her while I'm doing this, so I apologize if she keeps chiming in in the background. So Celebrate Physical Analyzer, I do believe added in support. And to be honest, I have not compared that to what I'm about to show you. So in all fairness, it may do something similar to what you're about to see. Um, Axiom is honestly where I start. And it is a great start on what you can actually get with Alexa. So I want you to be able to see what you can get here. Um, if anyone else knows of any other tools that is doing this well, please chime in and let me know. Um, you can type it in the questions window. That's easier for me to see versus the chat. But what we want to look at is, Alexa heard it. What can you get? So when we look over here, I loaded my device. And this is my actual iPhone. You can see I have a lot of crap on there. And as we start looking through, on the left-hand side, do you see over here, we have Internet things. And it says um, Amazon Audio Activity and Amazon Alexa web resource. We have 12 items. So then I start looking over here and this is where it gets interesting. So in here you can see things like play Ed Sheeran radio, that's me. I can guarantee you play I just want a rolly is not me. Also what is 12 divided by three? I hope that's not me. I have an almost five year old so you can see all of these things here. But let's say this one right here, play Felice Naughty Dog. And I was like, what in the heck is that? What if that actually matters? Um, if you look down here too, Alexa adds sponges to the shopping list, um, Skippy Natural Peanut Butter. If you need to put a voice behind one of these actual artifacts, what will you actually find? And can you do it? So this is where I was interested in doing this. And what I found was really interesting is not only could I do that, but I could say in which room of my house this request was made on because I have different Alexas named different things. So you can narrow it down if you know what to do. So the first thing we want to do is determine who made this request where she heard play Felice Naughty Dog. We have a date of 324-2018. And then we have this resource URL. This is very, very helpful right here. So when we click on this, we can look at these actual items here. So I go, let me go back one slide. So this resource URL, keep that in mind. When we click here, I go out to com Amazon Echo documents and this local storage file, which is where Axiom is pulling this information. And I know that because it tells me over here on the source on where it's getting it from. And that's what I like. This is where this is really cool. So if we start looking through this file right here, we can see that we have, we keep going through it saying, Alexa heard, Alexa played Felice Naughty Dog. And then over here, we can see the date timestamp, and that's awesome. And then we have this unique information right here. And we keep going, and we can see source device serial number. We can see what it is. And then we know down here, she's like, hey, you asked for this because I heard play Felice Naughty Dog. But you know what? It's saying, did Alexa hear correctly? And she's saying, I'm gonna play Felice Navidad. Maybe that's what she meant instead. So unfortunately for me, I get to listen to Felice Navidad year round because my four year old does love it. Um, fortunately for me, I don't have to request it anymore because she knows Felice Naughty Dog is Felice Navidad. So we can get all of this here. Where this is also interesting, if you look in this local storage file, Let's say that it wasn't a simple verbal command like this, if it was something that was actually really incriminating. If you heard what the person actually said to her versus what her response was, if it was help me or I'm being attacked or who knows what was said, you may actually be able to read the words here. And this was all unencrypted. And this is from my iPhone 10 um, running the latest iOS version at the time of May. I always update. So it was all there. What is also interesting are these files down here, the local data SQLite and the Alexa mobile iOS com SQLite file. Now, some of the columns 
in those databases are encrypted, but not all of it. So what I did now is I'm gonna go back a few and I want to target right here where it has this web address, this link that says audio in it. And when we do that, what we see here is it takes me to this prompt over here on the left-hand side where it says Amazon Alexa, and this is where you do need my login for my Amazon account. Now, make sure you have consent or legal authority to collect or even listen to it. You should not be doing this if you don't have consent from someone. If you have your own device, it's really cool to dump your own device and take a look at what Axiom is pulling versus what you can hear and how it points you directly to those files. So that's exactly what I did. And when we want to put the criminal behind this, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to hear this or not, let's see. You can hear that that is not me, that that would be my son, Jack, unfortunately saying play Felice Naughty Dog, which I found ironic that there is something Felice Naughty Dog, and you can feel bad for me that I listen to it year round. But this is really cool if you think about what you can do. So just from getting what is not encrypted and stored on the device, our data at rest, if we have access to the cloud, we can put the entire Alexa picture together. It's really awesome. Um, I was also able to go through, just so you're aware, and look at those databases. And while some of the data was encrypted, I could see my contacts. I could see people who I could drop in on. I was able to interpret grocery lists. Um, if I wanted to see who added something to a list or a to-do list, you could go out and listen to their voice as long as you have consent. Um, in my house, we have two Alexa devices that are in different rooms. It is all associated to my account. So my password would get you access to it. Um, you will hear my kids speaking to it, my husband speaking to it, anyone that comes into my house. Who knows, you would probably hear work conversations because just like now as I'm doing this webcast, she keeps picking up and I see that blue ring spinning. So she's tracking all of this. So I guarantee if I dump my device again, we're going to see all of these conversations and probably what looks really chaotic based upon what I'm speaking about right now. So. If you believe that she may be involved in the crime, and involved meaning your key witness, first thing to consider is do you even see the Alexa? Um, if you don't see the Alexa or if the person doesn't have the Amazon app or the Echo app on their device, then you may have to go straight to cloud. Um, look at their internet history. If you look at their internet history, can you possibly recover their Amazon password? And if you can, and you have legal authority to do so, can you log in and listen to it? So it's just kind of cool on what you can actually get if you're willing to dig and head to the cloud. But there are other considerations. So I just mentioned heading to the cloud. And now I wanna talk about some of the things that could occur on the device when you're doing these steps and just things in general that I find concerning when I use these tools. And depending on your job and where you work, you may wanna decide one way or the other on what you're actually going to look at. So the first thing that's huge I know in my classroom is your footprint left behind. There are some people that I know that work in environments where if they leave a footprint behind on a device, it could either end up where a person is killed because they're working with the government or they're working with some organization or that the person that's doing the investigation themselves could be in trouble. So I wanna make sure you're aware of what is left behind. So this is an Android device here. And I acquired this Android device. This one, I believe, was running NuGet, possibly Oreo. Um, I think it was a Pixel. And you can see here, I'm looking under data. I have com.celebrite, log, transfer, and then two date timestamps in the Celly log file. That actually tracked exactly what was being extracted from that device. So be careful. Do you know what traces are left behind? Um, do you even care? If you work in an environment where you collect evidence, it's in the evidence room, you never give it back, you probably don't care. But if you are doing covert operations, this could matter. If you're working, um, let's say even an e-discovery case or an internal investigation, are you allowed to give back devices with traces of tools on it or do you have to clean it? So you need to be aware of what is left behind. Um, also with cloud acquisition, you will definitely 100% leave a trace. Um, whether you are logging into their Google, their Amazon, their iCloud, you will definitely 100% leave a trace. They're going to get alerted. 
you'll get an email or a text message. Um, they may get the two-factor authentication pop-up. They may get a text message with their Google code. So there are a lot of things that could actually occur. Um, also, if there's security enforced on the device, that could affect you. So then to keep everything honest, I looked at Axiom and the process traces that were left behind. And one thing that I found interesting here is this process was done on my Android device. This is a test device. And I plugged it in and I selected full dump. The reason I selected full dump is because I believe that this device was already rooted. So when we start looking at this, let me change my magnifier here. We can see my ID and it said it was unable to be rooted with new root. So then I guess just goes down and tries different options. It's trying safe root and it's all super user APK. And then it pushes, it looks like get root, SU, install recovery, SH, unroot to the device. And it says it's uninstalling super user APK. And then ultimately the device was unable to be rooted with safe root. At this point, the tool just continued. So Axiom just continued trying things and I was not prompted for anything else. Down here, you can see that it's saying, okay, um, here it's saving to HMahalik desktop phone dumps. And we could see um, the imaging of the device and we can see Axiom, Axiom and my date. And then down here, deploying acquire agent to the device. And that's my same one. And it says, it, was successfully installed. So now I've tried to install all of these things, uninstalled stuff. I've installed agent. And then down here it says, hey, if it does not decrypt properly, this is where this is key. Mag123 will be used for the backup process. So there is your possible password if you can't get in. And then ultimately, when you look here, backing up device, creating backup device, and what's it using? ADB. So what I would prefer, and this was a huge lesson learned to me, I on Android start down here and work my way in reverse because of all the traces left behind. I will do a simple ADB backup before I connect to my tools and then I back my way out or do a simple logical extraction because all of these footprints were left behind on the device. Um, and I say left behind on the device, this log is from my computer, from the Axiom logs but you have to assume that all the attempts of installing and uninstalling are left behind on the device as well. And those will be stored depending on the device in various locations. So now with cloud. So if cloud is your only data, many, many options for pulling cloud data. Um, I've tried many of them when doing the updates for my 585 course, because we put a lot of cloud into that course material now because it's a reality. A lot of information is only going to be stored in cloud. And I know that Magnet's doing a webcast. I think they did it this morning. They're doing another one tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock, which I'm chiming into and listening, where they also discuss all the stuff that's in cloud. Things like iMessage, your um, Android SMS, Maps, a lot of it is only going to be stored there and not on the device itself. So many options on what you can extract here. Um, I would say all tools aren't created equally. Um, it just depends on what you want to get and what you have access to. But the one thing for sure is you are going to need their credentials to access this information unless you can pull the creds through the device itself. But most often is when you click on the button, it prompts you for the next screen, sign into their Google account, sign into their iCloud and provide the credentials. Once this happens, the user then gets their alerts. So here it's telling me that someone on a Windows operating system on May 2nd, 2018, used my Apple ID to log in the iCloud through a web browser. So consider that these things do occur. So now we go out and we log in. And this is where you may have some issues to deal with. If you are only trying to get my call logs from, let's say consent or search warrant says you are allowed to get call logs from Heather Mahalik's iPhone. What can you extract at this point? And this is where it's hard because obviously most of you are gonna type in Heather Mahalik's iPhone that you can grab, grab that. And Michael, yeah, you're saying call logs, period. But here's the issue. And Josh, you're right too. Will there be call logs on my watch? There will be. Um, Patrick is saying phone and watch. 
Yeah. Will there be call logs on my Mac? Yes. Yeah. If they're all connected, absolutely. There will be all of these items could be set that I have data synchronization, that I have Apple continuity, that I'm syncing the iCloud. Technically, depending on my son's iPad mini there, there could be my call logs on his iPad and they're not in this situation. So in this situation, you would need to collect the call logs from my iPhone, my Mac, and my watch in order to get access to it. So it's not as easy as it may look. And this is where some people get really confused on what can you or can't you grab. When I then continued, Axiom prompts you to enter a warrant number. I entered a fake one, but Jad informed me that you can skip that, but I thought I was being really crafty. Um, make sure you don't enter fake warrant numbers. This was my own data, so I assumed I didn't need a search warrant since I was giving my own consent. Um, not all tools are going to prompt you and say, hey, make sure you have proper authority. So make sure you do the right thing and you know before you proceed. Um, also remember, the user is going to be alerted. One thing that I was not expecting though with iPhone specifically is depending on the tool and the iOS version, on some instances in some of the tools like Elcomsoft, for example, it only prompted me to re-enter my iCloud passcode when I started using my phone again. Um, Axiom and Celebrate immediately locked me out for security reasons. And I got an alert on my device saying, you've been locked out for security reasons once that cloud data was pulled. So I found that to be a little concerning, but just in my latest version of iOS, Elcomsoft is doing that too. So it's definitely an Apple thing. So if you're worried about that, or if you have the device in front of you and you're doing covert operations, you need to make sure you get the password in a state where it's not doing that. Um, what we also recommend is if you pull cloud data and you can kind of encourage someone into giving you consent, Tell them, hey, after I pulled this cloud data, you should reset your password for security purposes, or if you're doing an internal work investigation. And then that way that kind of lifts that weight off of you knowing that, hey, they're gonna be locked out and they're gonna have to answer their security questions most likely to get back in. So it's not as easy as you would assume. And then something that I also found out that was kind of cool is cloud sync data and iCloud backups. Are these the same thing or not? And they are not created equal. This is where some tools are different than others. And Apple Maps is a perfect example. I wrote a blog post two years ago, um, my first one on Apple Maps, and that was with the intro of 10.1.1 of iOS. And then I just wrote a new one just around April of this year with updates that I found. So when we look at Apple Maps, history.maps data was in use up through iOS 8 and then it switched to a geohistory.maps data file. This is my current iPhone, and you can see down here, pins.map data seems to be getting updated, but that geohistory.maps data file is completely gone. But what's strange is when I look at my iPhone, I can see it, so I know it's being stored somewhere. For the longest time, I thought Apple was encrypting it, and I was just completely wrong. They're storing it in the cloud. So when I go out and I pulled my cloud data, I used Elcomsoft to do this because it pulls cloud sync versus iCloud backups. And you can see over here, I had 15 records and it's telling you my most recent one is from 3-3-2018. My oldest is from December 20th, 2016. And then it tells you here, Jim stakes, the coordinates, the date it was viewed, and here is what my phone is showing. Now where some people get confused is they're like, you know what, I don't have an iCloud backup. So clearly there's nothing in cloud sync and that is not true. Um, some things that Apple is deciding for you is going to be saved in cloud. And it's just, can you access it or not? So not everything is going to be accessible on your device. You are going to have to try to get it from cloud. And I did show all of this stuff to the engineers after the Magnet User Summit. So hopefully they will start looking at the cloud sync data as well, because it's kind of cool. And I think I have a question up here, let me see. Okay, so a good question. Can I clarify on what exactly triggers the lock for security reasons lock? Um, what I, I don't know exactly how it's happening. Um, initially, what I thought was occurring is when I did multiple cloud pools, that Apple is just kind of protecting the user by locking it because they know that someone is accessing their cloud data. But then I tested it on new devices that I created iCloud accounts for and did one pool. And that one 
tool itself, just lock the account. So I believe it's some kind of protection mechanism with Apple, and I don't know why. Because if I log in just as iCloud and look at my data, it's when you're pulling down the actual backups that's concerning. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. I don't have an exact technical way on how they're actually doing it, Patrick, but hopefully that kind of gives you a clue. But it was from me extracting the backup using the commercial tools is what locked it for security reasons. And I was able to unlock it. It just made me panic because I couldn't answer one of my security questions at first until I had to think. And it's one of those situations of why do we even set these security questions that we don't know the answers to? So something to consider with your tools. Back to that first slide where I said don't have a monogamous relationship. It's actually not the vendor's fault. It's not the tool's fault. There is so much data. All of us users do different things with these devices. Um, there are so many apps out there. And I am that person that looks at these random, random applications. You have to consider what is their return on investment to parse that application? Um, why do they care about Dunkin' Donuts coffee and where you're actually going to pick up your coffee every morning? Does it make sense? I care about that because of location artifacts. So there are some things you will have to do on your own. That's where things like the dynamic app finder in Axiom is going to be fantastic at parsing this additional information. Um, the application section in Oxygen is a great cheat sheet because it shows you everywhere where it's pulling that information from. Um, in Celebrate, they have their fuzzy plugins that run in the background, also fantastic. Use these things and the tools that you use to help you narrow down what you then need to parse. Um, if you find a bug, this is where I have a lot of issues with people that are like, oh, yeah, I saw that forever ago and I didn't tell anyone. If you don't tell someone, it's going to haunt someone else. So there are so many people out there that don't have time to validate. They don't know how to validate. Um, they have pressure on them to just go through and hurry up. So if this is something you stumble across or some people are afraid, they're like, you know what? I don't want to tell the vendor that something's not working because what if it's me? And I'm right there with you. Um, I was using Axiom at NetWars at a SANS event a month ago, and Jessica Hyde was standing behind me. And half the times I raised my hand, it was something legit. Other times it's because I wasn't using the tool properly. So it happens to everyone. Don't be ashamed at reporting it. Um, also know there are things that are permanently going to keep you out of these devices. So you're, you could have mobile device management. You could have damaged data ports. Um, you could have the latest and greatest, which everyone's talking about if it's the iPhone and the ports locked down. You can't use one of those special lightning connectors to get through. So lots of things are going to happen. We just have to evolve and keep getting better. Bottom line, we have to keep digging and figuring out how these artifacts got onto the device, why the tool is interpreting them incorrectly, and then take it from there. And this is the number one thing I hear right here. I have no time. I can't validate. If you have no time and you cannot validate, the worst thing you can do is print out an entire report from your tool and say all these artifacts are correct. Um, I've worked e-discovery, so I get it where they're like, Heather, you have three bill of hours to work on this, and it should have taken three weeks. So if that's something that you were dealing with, what I recommend is put a little disclaimer in saying the following, the following artifacts have been validated using more than one tool or whatever your company recommends you write. And then I always had a disclaimer statement at the end saying the follow Following artifacts are simply what is reported by the tool and have not been proven to be correct or created by the user. Just bottom line, and then you can give your information. So that way you're not putting your name to something that's not correct. Um, what I usually do is consider the investigation. You're not going to have time to dig through every single artifact on these devices anymore. It's impossible. There is as much, if not more, data on smartphones these days than you would find on hard drives. And most people don't go file by file on a hard drive. So how are you going to do that on a phone? Um, consider your tools. What is your strongest triage tool? If you're looking for browser artifacts, are you looking for databases? Are you looking for applications? You need to choose wisely on your tool. Let your tool tell you what it knows. And then dig from there, only when necessary. In this example here, I had to dig in three different things, but honestly, they didn't take that long. One did require some testing with their status flags, but the other two were pretty quick once I could get access to what I needed. So just be careful. You don't want to get yourself into a situation where you just kind of haunt yourself. And if it does not make sense, let's say you're looking at the data and you're like, what in the heck is happening here? 
So this is what I first saw with iOS 11. And I'll mention my blog on this later. But this last date red. If last date red is zero, what do you think that means? Think about this. If there is no date red, what do you think that could be? It's not an unread message. System's a good guess, Patrick. That's not it. Good guess. It's not deleted. There are actual entries. What's the other option if it's not incoming? What could it be? Outgoing. So those ones were simple outgoing messages. And this is one of those things where I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I created test data to verify that. But yep, you have to. So here we have, under last date red, we have these two different timestamps. So we have our nine digit and we have our 18 digit timestamps. The tools didn't like that initially. But you can fix this just by writing queries, doing some sample test data. Um, what I, I was finding is the tools were doing well if the conversation started prior to iOS 11, where they weren't doing well is when you had a conversation that initially started in iOS 11. Didn't know how to interpret it. So you may have to play around with it a little bit. Um, Paul Sanderson wrote a fantastic blog post, and I know his SQLite Forensic Browser goes into detail on it, and I believe it's also in his new book as well. I should know that. I swear I read it. I don't know if I read it on his blog or when I was doing technical editing for him, but on SMS messages and recovering deleted SMS messages from iMessage and iPhone specifically, because it is very difficult to do. So in closing here, research and share. Um, never think that you don't have something to contribute. There's someone out there is always going to know something more than you. I don't care if it's your first day doing forensics. You probably know something that people who have been doing this for 20 years don't know. So anything you find that you're willing to put out there, do it. Um, write blogs, write books. I'm more of a proponent of blogs these days versus books, but to each their own write a tweet about it. Who cares? Just put it out there for the world to see. And honestly, you will get some haters along the way, but who cares? The people that you will benefit are far better and far outweigh the risk of having people who are just negative. Um, report any bugs. Can't say that enough. Make sure you have test data. Everyone has a phone. There's your test data. If you only have one phone and you don't have any friends, reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you with my fake personas. So there's always something to consider. Also consider the updates. What do the manufacturers advertise that's coming in the update and what will it actually look like? Um, I have to put in my small little disclaimer here and then I'll get to the questions. So 585 is the advanced smartphone forensics course offered by the SANS Institute. Um, it is, I would say my first baby because this course came out right before my son was born. Um, actually, I was still writing it, so it's kind of tied with him. We do have a certification for it. It's the GISF cert, um, vendor neutral, GIAC approved. Um, you can see the new gorgeous coin over here. Let me zoom in on that puppy. We have a brand new forensic challenge that we just introduced in June. So if you want to take the course coming up, you'll get brand new forensic challenge where we will include some of the cool artifacts and stuff that I included in this talk. Um, it is a vendor neutral course, but we do provide you access to Axiom, to Blacklight, Oxygen, Celebrate tools, Paul Sanderson's tools. We give you what we believe are the best tools to do your job. And then you get to choose which ones you want to use and why. So you get to make, actually have it make sense for you and your organization. Um, with this course, you get 24 hands on labs, a brand new forensic challenge, a take home case, and then additional labs that where we want you to manually pull data if you have an iPhone from your data or from your device, if you have an Android using ADB to interact with your device. So we do want you to think outside the box. What it is not is a 101 course on how to use these tools, press buttons to extract data. What it is, is what to do when the tools disagree. So everything that I talked about in this presentation, that's what we focus on. Um, parsing, query drafting, decompiling malware, the things that are a little bit more than just the push button. Um, we do offer a 50% law enforcement discount um, online and live training, but there's only so many that are offered in live events. So if you are interested in a live event and you are law enforcement, 
if you reach out to me, I'll put you in touch with the correct people. Or you can go straight to smarterforensics.com where I blog and it tells you exactly how to do it. It's pretty easy and you get half off the cost of the course. Um, I was just made aware late last evening that there are two seats that were just released for my Sandsfire course next week in DC. I know it's last minute, but there are two seats in the classroom available. Um, there's also simulcast. Now the issue with simulcast is it is closing at COB tomorrow. So if you're interested in simulcasting, what that means is you get the live classroom experience similar to this, except you get to see me on camera and you get to hear the questions live from the classroom. You get to ask questions, but then you also get four months of the recordings. So say you can't log in because of work commitment for four months, you have access to everything that happened in the course. And it's fantastic if that's a great way to learn. I actually found simulcast very helpful when studying for the certs because you get the recordings ongoing to listen to. Um, other upcoming courses, I do wanna highlight New York City in August. Um, Lee Crognelli is teaching that one. I will also be in New York. I am co-teaching FOR 500, the Windows Forensics course with Ladrina. Um, Lee and I did put together a really cool at night talk though, that we are going to be debuting at Sandsfire and then redoing at New York City and in Denver about creating test data and getting intimate with your data set and learning what does it mean, what's the easiest way to approach it, and our recommendations on how we've been successful. So we're also probably going to do that in DC in December. If I can't make it down, I'll probably simulcast in to do that co-talk with her. Um, but you can see lots of simulcast opportunities. We are around the world. We're gonna be in Prague, Saudi Arabia, On Demand, Be Live. So if you're interested, the slides will be available. Um, these are my sources and my smart friends. And I did thank Jad and Jessica for tolerating all my crazy, crazy questions while creating this. And really Jessica and Moody for all my crazy questions while doing net wars with Axiom. A lot of user error there. Um, my iOS SMS parser is available on GitHub. Um, there is the YouTube talk that Jessica and Brian Moran did on Alexa, if you're interested in more of that. Um, one thing that I don't have listed here, but it is on smarterforensics.com, is Sarah Edwards and I have an Apple Watch talk at the Defer Summit in Austin, Texas, which I think was pretty cool. It's available on the SANS YouTube channel. You can also find that at Sarah's blog, mac4n6.com or smarterforensics.com, which is going to be on the next slide. Um, you'll see I link a lot of stuff to Sarah, and she links a lot of stuff back to me, but you can find it all there. And I do have a few questions, so let me see what these are here. Oh, thank you, Paul. Paul included, um, I'm not sure that everyone can see this, so I am going to put this in the chat. Paul included his link for his blog on SMS, so I just sent that out to everyone. Paul, it's a good thing I was speaking good of you. I didn't even know you were on here. Let's see if there's another question. Hang on. Yes, chiming in on reaching out to the software author if you're not sure how to use it. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Dale, that's awesome. That is a lush soapbox. That is fantastic. Any questions for me? And if you think of any, um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Heather Mahalik, not a very creative name. Um, you can email me, Heather at smarterforensics.com. You can come to any of the SANS events. And if you're interested, if you live, let me go back to this one slide really quick. If you live near any of these cities, um, I actually wasn't aware, but at night events are free. You can just request through SANS access. So if you live in New York City and you wanna hear Lee and I do our talk, feel free to come. Um, same thing in Vegas, there will be at night talks. Um, in Denver, if you're in Denver, Colorado, Lee and I will be speaking there. Um, I think I'm going to do a talk with Terrence McGuire in Miami, in DC. So if you are local and you're interested, you can reach out to me directly and I can get you set up with the right people to get you access. But at night talks are also really cool because it's essentially this with a live classroom feel. All right. Well, thank you for attending. I didn't think that would actually take a full hour and it always does. So 
Thanks for spending your afternoon with me. Hope to see you in 585 soon and also at the Magnet Summit next year because I hope I get invited back. All right, well, thank you so much, Heather, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.